Our own totally unscientific survey suggests that some people, us included on occasion, have had difficulty comprehending exactly where they stand on a given issue. And it is, gentlemen, sometimes difficult to pin you down on specifics. We would venture that no one knows their various positions better nor spots their weaknesses quicker than they do themselves, which is why we've decided that this evening, as much as possible, they shall conduct their own debate, that they should be the ones to press each other for specific answers. I should also tell you at home this debate was taped this evening for their convenience because some of them have campaign commitments elsewhere early tomorrow morning. We'll be back in just a moment to begin. Gentlemen, I think you uh, already know that I will try not to intrude except as a <coughs> timekeeper and, and on those occasions when I really honestly don't understand what you're saying. I appeal to you all for plain English because you do sometimes lose us, I'm sorry to say, with your government jargon, or at least when you use government jargon. Um, it goes without saying that we hope for an exchange um, and not for speeches, and I hope uh, we also enjoy ourselves. I'd like to start with you, Governor Brown, if I may. Um, how do you differ? from the other candidates on what you would do for those people in America today who are clearly suffering because of the recession? How I would differ? I embrace the concept <clears throat> of a total revamping of the tax code. I think it is 4,000 pages of ambiguity, double taxation, contradiction, and unfairness. I would sweep it all away and I would create a flat tax of 13 percent on business, on individuals, and thereby free up the saving and investment that every single economist wants. And more than that, I would take immediate action to develop uh, jobs to deal with the central issue of energy waste in this economy, which is costing us $300 billion a year. And President Bush, and certainly the next president, could start within 24 hours putting thousands of people to work, retrofitting buildings, double painting windows, redoing and re-engineering heating and lighting, and other things like that that would, over a 10-year period, generate enormous savings that would pay for the employment of millions of people who don't have any jobs today. And that is a goal that is within our grasp, and it's totally financeable uh, by the gains that it would make in energy efficiency and make the whole economy better. Senator, <coughs> what, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with a flat tax, for example? Well, first of all, uh, some of what Governor Brown says is, is, is viable and should be done, but I think he's putting the cart before the horse. Uh, where I differ, I think, is that uh, I have a plan that I put into effect uh, called a blueprint to build a new America in which next year I propose we take $35 billion and put it right down to our cities and communities because they have plans on the shelf right now for road repair, bridges, uh, sewer and water systems, school renovation, things like that, that they can get people to work right away. With that money, we can put about a million people back to work next year immediately. And out of that, what we get is a better infrastructure. And that will let our private sector be a little bit more uh, efficient and more productive. Last year, the International Bank of Settlements in Geneva, Switzerland, came out with a study and said that one of the major reasons for the lack of productivity growth in the United States is our lack of investment in infrastructure. As a percent of output, Japan spends 23 times more than we do on infrastructure. And they're going to spend $3 trillion more in the next decade. Germany spends about 15 times more than we do. So we've got to start putting our <coughs> investments in infrastructure, both physical, <coughs> physical resources and human resources. So what I would do as immediately as president is to get that money down to our communities. They can start putting people to work. And secondly, I would implement what I call my children's trust initiative to begin the process immediately of reaching down to our young children, getting them healthy starts in life, fully funding the Head Start program, making sure that every kid in America is ready to go to school by the age of five. Governor Clinton. Well, let, we're supposed to talk about what Governor Brown said, I think, but, but let me just take a few seconds, and then I'd like to ask a follow-up question. Uh, I agree with much of what he said about energy conservation. I think there are... Uh, uh, forgive me, I don't think he spoke about energy conservation. Yes, he did. Hey, but, uh, investing in energy investing efficiency. In, right, thank as you. a way to put people basic, to work immediately in this job. Right. If, you're looking at, if you're looking at <clears throat> how to free up capital in this country to reinvest in public initiatives, it doesn't require a tax increase. There are basically three places, in defense reductions, in cost of control of health care costs, and in energy efficiency. So I agree with that. Uh, I believe we need a short and long-term economic strategy. In the short term, uh, I agree with much of what has been said. I also think we have a six-year highway plan that we've played for with President uh, Bush in the Congress passing the gas tax last year. 
Uh, all that money could be spent in two years simply by accelerating the letting of all the contracts. I think that should be done. I think we should do some things to stimulate the housing market. We need a short-term plan. But we really need a long-term plan for America's economic revival, and one that goes well beyond what was done in the 1980s. In the 1980s, there was too much emphasis given to keeping the cost of capital and taxes down on upper-income people. You see this uh, New York Times story today. It will be in every newspaper in America tomorrow that uh, in the 80s, the top 1% of the people had 60% of the net economic growth in the 80s. That's because we concentrated too much on just keeping the cost of money down and increasing the value of the stock market. Now, the stock market tripled in the 80s. We can't do any better than that. I certainly don't want to hurt it, but it tripled. Average wages went down, the work week increased, productivity declined, and the working poor exploded. What I think we need to do is to have a people-based economics. We need to invest more in education and training and set up a system literally for permanent training and retraining of the workforce. Not just for kids, but for workers. If I'm one of these people who really is hurting from the recession, I apologize for intruding, when am I going to feel this relief? Well, the, on the short term, if you, on, the, on the worker initiatives, if you get the economy going again, if you keep the interest rates down, if you get the housing market going, if you make some of these other public investments, you'll begin to see it. But let's be honest, you have two problems. You have a three-year recession, which is the worst since before World War II. But every one of us would agree that America's productivity has been going downhill for well over a decade. And you need a long-term economic strategy. We've got to tell the people the truth about that. Senator Tonga. Well, during the uh, Reagan-Bush years, the United States increasingly lost its capacity to compete. I mean, Japan has an economic strategy. Germany has an economic strategy. They know where they're going. Taiwan <coughs> has an economic strategy. If you walk out here in the street and ask anybody, what is George Bush's economic battle plan to rescue this country, they could not tell you. Now, MIT did a study two years ago. What was happening to this economy? We've lost 1.2 million jobs in manufacturing. So the Japanese and the Germans and everybody else is simply ebbing away our manufacturing base. And the conclusion of the MIT report was very simple. If you wish to live well, you must produce well. Now, there was an article in the New York Times uh, this Sunday. Japan has now exceeded us, not only in capital investment, but in R&D. And they are half our size. So it is inevitable, if that continues, they will get the high-paid jobs, and we will end up, as we are now, losing competitive advantage. So ultimately, what it comes down to, you have to invest in the infrastructure, the personal, the manufacturing base, the engine that drives the economy. People need to work. The average working man or woman in this country, all they want is a job. Give us the jobs that we can provide for our people. So you have to look at where the engine is. The engine is manufacturing. If you look at, for example, the, the age of American equipment in the factory floor, on farms, that kind of thing, we are simply falling further and further behind. Help can us we, pick out the differences between well, you a little better, though. Well, yeah, can we follow up on that? I have some real differences that I think <coughs> we can point out. Right. Governor Brown? So, well, wait, 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 wait a minute. Senator Governor Harkin, Brown? everybody got their plan out. You, you cut me off. I didn't get to say what I thought we ought to do. But go ahead, Jerry. Well, um, well, because this be doesn't generous. go just to the plan. It goes to the basis of power. Uh, you see, we, you can hear a lot of things about tax cut. He has his tax cuts for what he calls the middle class. He has some tax cuts for what he calls business. Uh, well, it is business. And I'm saying the problem is that we have a rigged system, that it's very cozy, it's very tightly connected, that the money that go to these gentlemen come from lawyers and investment bankers and people who are in the top 1%, the people who did very well in that New York Times uh, article there, these people pay for these gentlemen's campaigns. Then, the whole system is rigged so that, for example, the SNL scandal, which is a product of the politicians in Washington and their SNL campaign contributors, is now being cleaned up by lawyers on Wall Street getting paid $600 an hour. They've rigged the system, so there's not enough money to pay a nurse's aid or a, a teacher's aid even $6 an hour. So you have that imbalance. Fair, Where do the, fair, is it, wait a minute, I have one more thing that we haven't heard any talk about the strengthening labor unions, uh, having employees buy ownership in the management. And the reason why the rich are always going to get richer is because most people in this country don't have the tools to take back power. And I think that's the trouble 
uh, why this imbalance is growing, and my campaign is highlighting that by the, the campaign limitation of $100, but also calling for greater empowerment of trade union people, uh, employees. We've got to balance this thing so that the management doesn't pay themselves $2 million. Uh, the, the, the lawyers and all the people who go to these $1,000 fundraisers, which you are the champion at, Bill, and you're coming up, but you're still a, a distant second. These are the people... Said he pointing at Senator Tsongas. Uh, these are the people who are doing very well, and those plain folks... Don't wait for me to interrupt. ...that may be watching, they have no power because they don't pay the money, and they're just ghosts in this political campaign, and that's why this is a campaign the of only, insurgency. Uh, We're fighting that. The only problem is, because <clears throat> Jerry Brown's a born-again insurgent, he was the biggest of the big money raisers until just he, until he decided to run for president. But look, I want to ask well, you a question about your I'll answer minute. that in due course. Just a minute. <clears throat> However, I do agree that the organized interest groups brought us the savings and loan debacle, which is the worst thing that ever happened. But I was the first person, even before you, who said we ought to limit the deductibility of excess, excessive executive pay. I said we ought to raise income taxes on high-income people to give middle-class people and low-income people a break. I came out for an empowerment strategy for lower-income working people. But let me ask you a question about well, your plan. Wait, let me ask you a question about your plan. Okay. Don't you also require, in addition to the 13% income tax, a 13% value-added tax? Right, on business. All right, so if that tax gets passed along, won't everybody really be paying 26% of their income directly or indirectly no, in taxes? No, it'll have no price effect because we abolish the same amount of taxes as we replace with a 13%. That would happen, as you describe, if we did it as an add-on. This no. is a substitution. No Social Security tax, no gasoline oh. tax, as our friend Paul Songus wants. Oh, I agree uh, with this that. This eliminates all the taxes we now pay. Yeah, but if I'm out here making, if I'm making twenty-five thousand dollars a year, and I'm just trying to figure out if I elect Brown president, right? You know, I'm going to get rid of my Social Security tax, my gas tax, <coughs> and my income tax at the right. federal level, right? And I'm going to pay a thirteen percent flat income tax minus your rent, in minus your my rent. And your charity. And charity, and I'm going to pay indirectly, and, 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 I'm, and I'm going to pay indirectly a 13% VAT tax. No, because the management, the business, will not be paying the withholding tax on Social Security, and they're not going to be paying any corporate tax. So net to the whole economy, it has a zero price effect. Yeah, but to the average person, they're either going to be paying money out of their pocket or they're not. I just don't want people to think. They're only going to pay 13% under your plan, but I think they are you're going to make us all look like we're going to tax them twice, and I don't believe that. No, they're only going to pay this 13 This is not a rabbit in the hat. I mean, no, you're going to no, still no. pay 26%. Look, this, we collected a trillion dollars two years ago in the federal government. Will there be a VAT on Under this 13%, uh, the value added and uh, on the personal, you still collect the same trillion. It's revenue neutral, so it shouldn't increase the price to the total company. Peter, if I, if I may, <clears throat> I think we just lost half of our audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did. In this discussion. Let me just correct um, Governor Brown at one point. Um, I grant you I'm not quite in the big leagues of money raising. But the fact is that I have gotten money from 22,000 people. Okay? 85% of them contributed $115 or less. So I, you know, I will grant that Jerry's done a better job in that respect, but I'm not too far behind you. And um, I just want to get those facts on the table. Well, there's one point, though. We were talking about power. Mm -hmm. And as long as the Wall Street folks that put on these, these big fundraisers and they become co-chairs, they were in the Dukakis campaign, the Mondale campaign, as long as they're playing the role they're playing in the Democratic Party, you're not going to see uh, trade unions developing more power to give average working people the kind of tools and the clout they need to get better wages. There's a right. reason why people Jerry, get paid so little. Senator they don't Murray, have any clout could I to, to bargain. That's why. Could I answer that? Please. <clears throat> Let me say that I started my campaign two days from now, it'll be a year. One year. I did one fundraiser on Wall Street, and that was three days ago. You know who put it on? A Greek restaurant owner. <laughs> so, well, when you start you coming say, up in the polls, they like to give you more money. That's the way the system works. Well, thank how much, God how there's much some Greeks owning restaurants. How much, did, restaurants how much did you raise? Excuse me? How much did you raise? In that event? Mm. 70000 Is that the most you ever raised in one event? Um, no, I did a Greek event in New York. We raised uh, all told about two hundred thousand dollars. Okay, Senator Harkin. Well, first of all, uh, there's another problem with this tax. I'm going to get to in a second. Yeah. But uh, you know, for the last decade, uh, Governor Brown, as uh, chairman of the Democratic Party out in California, and as other things, as Governor Clinton has said, has been one of the biggest money raisers in America. He's done that, and now he sits there and sort of in a self-righteous manner paints us all with one brush. I, I kind of resent that. I'll tell you why. Because, yes, I have taken money from people who probably are on Wall Street. And I've taken money from lawyers. You bet I have, Jerry. 
I'll tell you one other thing. Congressional Quarterly did a study last year of those senators who had the biggest opposition to George Bush. Guess who was number one? Tom Harkin. For the eight years that Ronald Reagan was in office, I was tied with number one in opposition to Reagan's trickle-down economic policies. So you see, <clears throat> it doesn't make any difference. It, it depends on who you are and how much guts you got. And whether you got the courage to stand up to people and to fight for la working people, for laboring people, for our family farmers, that's who I fought for. Governor Brown likes to portray himself as an outsider. And that I guess we're insiders, I guess, I don't know what, or maybe I'm the insider since I've served in Congress for 17 years. As I've said so many times, it's not outside or inside, Governor Brown, it's whose side you're on. And you take a look at my record. I have been on the side of union people. That's why labor unions are supporting me, because I fought for them. Even though, yes, I've gotten money from a lot of different people who have given me money. But look at the record. I've been there. You say you've got how many? 20-some thousand contributors. I've got 35,000 contributors nationwide. Average contribution, $50. I bet you don't have that many. I've got 35,000 contributors. Well, I'll tell you this. I've got 35,000 that, that I started with a long time ago and it keeps building up. But here's what I'm, again, my point is simply this. You can't sit there and with a straight face and honestly paint us all with a brush and say that we're all corrupt, Jerry. You just can't do that. You know that. what I'm going to, I'll tell you what I'll say. I'll say that Congress is stuck. It is it, confirmed Clarence Thomas. It won't pass labor law reform. <clears throat> it won't uh, eliminate uh, the tip credit so that waitresses have to pay uh, out of their own tips their minimum wage. It's not uh, protecting workers uh, for situs picketing. I think that the working people are neglected. Not that you won't cast some good votes, Tom, but we have to join together and break the chokehold that's holding well, Congress well, in bondage. What we need is a that's president. What we, right. need, what we need is a president who hasn't been sitting on the sidelines like you have been, but we need a president who's been in there fighting in the trenches like I have for 17 straight years. I've been in those trenches, fighting for working people, fighting for our labor unions, fighting for women, fighting for minorities on civil rights bills and things like that. I've been in there and the record is clear. Is that enough to qualify him to be president, Governor? Well, I think he's qualified by his service to be president. I think I'd be a better one. But <laughs> l let, me, let me make a point. I think that uh, Jerry's got something to this you know, break down the power of the special interest in Washington, and I'm for limiting PAC contributions and limiting the cost of congressional campaigns and all that, but Tom made the real point, and I, I think we should all, we need, I agree with you, we ought to try to show our differences to the voters here tonight, but we need to tell them why we're running, too. And, and the truth is that for 12 years, for different reasons, the American people have voted for divided government. And a lot of what you're complaining about is the fact that America's problems have been neglected. If we had a president who was leading this country and working with the Congress and trying to move us off dead center and trying to get us to the point where we could compete and win again, I think it would make a big difference. I, I agree, I agree there's some problems in the system, Jerry, but you gotta admit, I mean, for different reasons, the American people thought, well, we'll vote for Reagan and Bush, they'll restrain spending, they'll be tough overseas, uh, they'll think government's bad and hold it down, but we better keep the Democrats in there, they'll restrain Reagan and Bush's worst instincts and preserve the gains of the past. And that's hunky-dory if people perceive things are going along all right. Meanwhile, the country's going downhill because, as Paul says, we have no economic strategy. The key is to elect a president who will lead and work with Congress. I think that's even more important than anything you can say about organized interest groups. If we get elected, any of us, on a plan to reform health care, on a plan to have a national economic strategy for a change, the Congress will enact it in a heartbeat because the people will be sending them a message. I think that's now, more now, important now than you, the You mentioned President Bush, so perhaps I could try to get a little more specific. Senator Songus, Governor Clinton has been saying recently that your economic proposals mirror those of President Bush and will not improve the lives of middle and lower class Americans. Is he right? Well, let me say that um, Tom voted against the Reagan tax proposal um, there were 11 senators who did so. I was one of them. 11. And so we were small then. It was obvious that what George Bush and Ronald Reagan were proposing was economic nonsense. It was money in America. You can have it all. We'll cut your taxes, we'll massively increase defense spending, and somehow it all work itself out. It was on a napkin. It was a, Arthur Laffer put down all this on a napkin, handed it to Ronald Reagan, and that's what's happened to this country. Three trillion dollars of debt. But the problem is that they have no strategy. It was this, this mystical, you simply lower taxes, somehow the economy will come around. But there are but a lot of the Democratic... Japanese have but done, but me, there, excuse me, just, sir, there are Democratic primaries. I forgive again my mm -hmm. interruption. There are Democratic primaries coming up next week in 11 states or caucuses. Voters are going to have to choose between the two of you. 
or the four of you, whatever the case may be. Can you the at least four of us. can you address the question of uh, of of what he has had to say about your economic proposals? He says you sound <coughs> like President Bush. Well, I was endorsed um, last Sunday by the Atlanta Constitution. And that's not a newspaper in my backyard. And what they said was that I had a pro-growth, economic growth policy with a progressive social agenda. What I'm saying very simply is, look, I've been in politics a long time. I would love to have come out for the middle class tax cut. You don't think my advisors beat on me to be for it? I assume so. They did. Yes. So why did I say no? I have to be the alternative that says whatever bullets we have, whatever economic bullets we have, have to be used to drive the economy so you give people jobs. You have all these people um, who are unemployed, who go home and cannot provide for their families, who say to their kids, well, I'm not sure what the future is for you. So I have to be the alternative that says I'm going to do what is necessary irrespective of the polling data. Yeah. Well, and the reason okay, that... I, 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 I want to make a point right there. Governor Brown, I, I think it's Governor okay. Clinton's okay. turn. Well, I think we need to be specific, if I might. <clears throat> because all four of us have different positions. Yes. And maybe if we could just give our positions and why without characterizing them, it would be good. Well, except, Governor, you were the one who characterized him uh, as sounding like President Bush, which is rather damning no. in the middle of a Democratic campaign, well, no. isn't it? What I said was, I quoted the Time essay saying it was trickle-down economics. Mm. Senator Songus and I agree on a lot of things. Number one, we agree you've got to have a pro-growth strategy. You can't just divide a pie that's not growing. I have worked hard to grow my economy. My state's created manufacturing jobs at 10 times the national average. I think I know something about that. But I believe the only tax incentives that work in a global economy are those that are specifically targeted that you cannot access unless you invest in American goods, American services, and American jobs. I think everybody here has probably voted for some kind of incentives like that in the past. An investment tax credit, a new business tax credit, uh, a low-income housing tax credit, a research and development tax credit, energy conversion tax credits, changes in the real estate rules for people that are investing in this economy. I'm all for that. My objection is to an across-the-board capital gains cut on stocks traded on the stock exchange, which is where Senator Songus concentrates this. And let me argue why. We tripled the stock market in the 80s. I, that's fine. We can't do any better than that in the 90s. We can't do better than triple. But average wages went down. The work week lengthened. Poverty exploded. We lost our competitive edge. So my argument is this inequality that we got was accompanied by declining economic growth. I want to give business incentives to invest in this economy, focus far more on how to reorganize the economy so we can compete with other countries, export finance, for example, and, and greater R&D targeted to new technologies, and put more emphasis into education and training put people first. Our real difference here is over whether we should have targeted or across the board uh, tax cuts. And that's how I feel about it. Now, Senator Harkin, I think, thinks we should take the money and put it directly in for infrastructure. And you can argue that. And I don't, I don't know where Senator, and Governor Brown says, have a flat tax across the board. But my argument is, if you look at the way the world works, money's mobile, management's mobile, all we got in this country is our people, our infrastructure, and the natural resources God gave us. We don't have anything else. And to give these across-the-board cuts to people who got, look at this, that's who's going to benefit from an across-the-board capital gains. The people that got 60 percent of the wealth in the last decade, and it did not make us a richer country. It was only in the 1980s that people said, growth now, fairness on down the road. Nobody ever thought that was possible before. Now we know it's not possible now. I, I, well, I, you don't need me to interrupt uh, each other. I, like to, <laughs> no, explain I, I think there's a very good much. point here that I want to make. I, all that growth it, re, is reflected in these big corporate managers that are making 150 times more than their workers are making. Ten years ago, they only made 60 times more. Now, that's not a function of the tax... Whatever. It's not a function of the tax code. It's a function of the disproportionate power that the management group now has in relationship to the ordinary working people. And what I say, it's not enough to play with either your targeted taxes or what Paul Songa says. He wants a temporary investment tax credit of $5 billion, and that's like a temporary mm. car rebate. As soon as you stop paying the rebate, you stop selling the cars. So I don't think that gets you very far. I think you've got to give real power to people. That's why I say you've got to strengthen the power of people to organize mm. collectively. And number two, you've got to give shares in the management to working people and make that mm. as easy as possible so those who work in a factory or an office, own part of the management. Then you're not going to see those gross salary perks to the top. And third, we have to use our public pension funds that constitute half the investment capital to promote a greater 
social and economic justice in this society. I think that gets us to the goal. Can I, can I risk being a little <clears throat> more specific, Ann? All of you favor cuts in defense spending. The South, where most of next week's I'm primaries take place. Could I have place. a chance to explain yes, what my position is? Absolutely, sir. Sorry, my apologies. Well, we're having this discussion. In Japan, they're investing. In Germany, they're investing. The net result is the Japanese working man, the Japanese working woman is going to have a job. And that is true in Germany as well. So there is an inevitability to what happens if you don't invest. The great American dream is uh, by men and women in small garages that have great ideas that become companies that employ people. Talk to those people today. You know what's going on? There is no capital for them to grow their companies and start companies. So what happens, they have two choices, starve, and that's what's happening today, or eventually sell that technology to the Japanese and the Germans and everybody else. This is something the Reagan Bush people have no sense of. So my capital gains is very simple. It says if you invest in those things which grow the economy, you're going to get a capital gains tax cut if you hold it long term. So if you're a speculator, I charge you a higher capital gains tax. If you hold it long term, it comes down. And the other interesting thing is that my capital gains tax is paid for by the wealthy. So what I'm saying to the wealthy of this country very simply is, you invest in America, you do very well. If you don't invest in America, you're going to get hurt. You have to give the people who have the funds the incentive not to go out and consume with yachts and this kind of thing, but to invest so people have jobs. Ultimately, we're going to get overwhelmed by the foreign competition. It's a very Darwinian world out there. And my job is to provide the economic strategy. That's why these endorsements have come, because there's an economic strategy and putting this thing together. Well, wait a minute. I, uh, yeah. I think Let I, Tom answer and then. <clears throat> again, that's really trickle down. Uh, that's what we've seen for the last 12 years. Uh, we take your tax dollars and we give it to the few at the top. We deregulate de business and trust them to do what's right. Look what it's got us. Leverage buyouts, junk bonds, mergers, SNLs, the whole panoply of things that have caused all the pain that we see in America today. And as a matter of fact, the facts don't bear out, uh, Paul, what you're saying. In the mid-1980s, we actually reduced the capital gains exclusion, or you might say, in the other, conversely, we increased capital gains tax, and venture capital actually increased. We actually had more venture capital. People invest in these things not because of a tax exclusion, but because they think that something's going to grow and they're going to make a profit on it. Let's face it. It has nothing to do with the capital gains. A capital gains tax, you get when you sell a business, when you sell something investment tax credit, which I'm in favor of, you get it right up front to buy new plant and equipment and put people to work. That's the way we had to go, investment tax credit. Now, secondly, let me, just, let me just finish one other thing. The blueprint for building a new America that I have come up with does two things. It provides short-term and long-term growth. First of all, short-term stimulus. Gets the money down and puts people to work next year, over a million people. And those million people will make a lot of money and they'll spend that money. It gets the wheels. It's bottom-up, not top-down. It's bottom-up. Secondly, I proposed what I call a children's trust initiative. And I'm telling you, it's not going to come on the cheap. I'm proposing over the next five years to invest $25 billion in our kids. That means maternal and child health care programs, women, infants, and children's programs, fully funding Head Start, getting these kids ready to go in life, fully funding the immunization program. The children's trust, get these kids started early in life on the right path. We know that if we do that, it's going to save us a ton of money later on. So you get the short-term term stimulus of putting people to work, and then you're looking down the road. The best place, if you want to invest in the future of this country, is invest in our children. That's the best place you can invest. We have to take a break, I regret, and we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back. All of you favor cuts in defense spending, um, but the South, where most of next week's primaries take place, has got a lot of defense industry, and people are going to be thrown out of work if you cut back on defense. How do you balance those two interests, Senator Songus. Well, there is going to be a defense, and we're going to have a strong defense, and that will continue. But the fact is the defense budget will start running down. But the fact is that most people in that industry have skills, very good skills. So it gets me back to my original idea. You have to grow new companies. So people who are displaced from the defense industry have some place to go to take their very considerable skills. It's probably, in, in a technical sense, the most competent and talented workforce that we have. The question is going to be, what do we then give them to do for a job? So when we talk about growing the economy, this is the cutting edge. So the average person who wants a job 
can get a job because we, like the Japanese and the Germans, grow new companies. So there are new companies for people to take mm -hmm. their skills to. Can I think I the danger of what Reagan and Bush have done is they went through this massive increase in defense spending. And now that we end up with the Cold War over and this contraction taking place, they have not provided the mechanism for new <coughs> companies to start up to employ people who are going to <coughs> desperately need that employment. I just think, I agree there should be incentives for new companies to start. But I think this shows another fatal weakness between our country, comparing our country to Germany or Japan, for example. Uh, we have to downscale the defense budget because it's all structured against the Soviet threat that isn't anymore. And I think all of us agree with that. But not very far from here in Tarrant County, Fort Worth, you have more defense-related unemployment than in any other county in America, I think. And, and the, already, in Southern California, where Jerry's from, you've got, you've got scientists and engineers driving taxi cabs. You've got factory workers out on the street. Because this is the only country in the world that would even consider of this kind of build down of its scientific and engineering and high tech manufacturing and servicemen and women workforce with no strategy. So I think while we do need a fertile growing ground for new companies, we also need a real strategy. I mean a real strategy. Number one, every dollar you reduce defense research and development, increase commercial research and development. Number two, set up an advanced products research agency just like we have now for defense products, for commercial projects to help take those ideas into an the advanced workplace. Advanced products research. Agency. agency, yeah. It's a government-private partnership, public-private partnership, to create new products in America. <coughs> Number three, give these plants some extra time on their contracts to convert the plants and to retrain the workers. And four, target the areas that we know we're going to need high-tech investment in, in the future. Environmental cleanup, environmental technology, space technology, the super collider, these kinds of technology-based areas of the future where you can put all these people to work. I don't think just creating an environment, unless you have a strategy, will work. Let me just give you one example and I'll cede the floor. Can I when, just ask about all those scientists you, so you said referring taxis? What you, they're listening to you tonight and how long are they going to have to wait? Well, they'll wait a lot less if I'm president than if George Bush is reelected. Uh, let me give you a comparable example. Japan, contrary to a lot of people's belief, they lose jobs too. Even Taiwan is now losing jobs to lower income countries. The difference is they have a plan. The Japanese lost their shipbuilding industry to the Koreans and the Brazilians. They had all these high-skilled factory workers. What would they do in America? They'd work around, walk around until their unemployment ran out, then they'd take a job making half what they used to make, and like Jerry says, or Tom says, it would break the local labor union because they wouldn't have any members left. What'd they do in Japan? They phased the thing out over 10 years, they retrained all the workers, they moved up, not down the economic ladder because they had a strategy. That's what we ought to do with the defense workers. They are too precious a resource not to not only have a good environment to move into, but a definite economic strategy. If we downplay this defense without a strategy to do something with those people, we're going to kill them and hurt the economy. You want to be specific about defense. <clears throat> Ronald Reagan and the Congress increased defense on the basis of the Soviet threat by 100% going up. It's 150 billion. All right, the Soviet threat's gone, so coming down, we know we're gonna cut it by 150 billion, which is half. We know that, we're gonna do it in five years, and the sad thing is, when there's no conversion plan, it's the working people who pay the price, not the executive right. of Boeing or the executive of Lockheed. They still get their pay raises, and it's the workers who walk because the politicians are not acknowledging we do need a strategy. High-speed trains, rebuild the shipping industry, expand the civilian space industry, get into various forms of energy. Uh, my whole program of millions of jobs to make America energy efficient will need a lot of engineers, a lot of trained people. You need a goal. That's, that's the way you get there. Senator now, Sanders I just want to say sorry. something about these targeted tax cuts. They make me a little nervous. And I'll tell you why, because they keep changing them. In 1986, capital gains was increased and the investment tax credit was abolished. Now everybody wants to reduce capital gains. Not everybody, Tom doesn't, but these two do. And they want to bring back investment tax credit. Well, if it's so good now, why was it bad five years ago? You churn the tax code. My 13% proposal will allow business to expense new equipment 100% the first year. No need for tax accountants and lawyers and half the IRS. This thing is simple. It takes effect immediately and it'll drive this economy forward in a way that these politically determined targets never will. You're smiling, Senator Tom. <coughs> uh, you're taking a pro-business position. <laughs> <laughs> Coupled with my pro-justice, pro-empowerment of working people position. Well, I quote the Atlanta Constitution when they endorsed me. 
pro-economic growth with a progressive social agenda. I'm proud of that. I'm very proud of that. Well, but your um, social well, agenda let me say that. is abortion and gay rights is not real economic power. I spoke in Florida two days ago to exactly the group you were talking about, people <clears> with <throat> great skills who are unemployed. And I said to them, if I give a 97 cents a day middle class tax cut, you're going to get a job? See, for them, it's not theory. For them, it's real, because they know that giving out 97 cents a day provides no jobs. You but have you to stimulate. What? Let me it's finish. So Let me finish. How's it you misleading? have to stimulate the economy. They need to have growth in the private sector so they can take their considerable skills someplace and get a job. So it's one thing to say to people who you know, have a job, well, we'll give you this tax cut. But the ultimate responsibility is that working men and women in this country need a capacity to get out there, have a job, and provide for their families. That's the kind of audience. That's the cutting edge. I mean, that's where our responsibility ultimately lies. How's it, who's he, who's he well, misleading I mean, how? Well, because he argues that the middle class tax cut undermines growth. I, we, both we, rose, we both raise taxes on upper income people. I argue for a modest tax cut and fairness for the middle class. He argues instead for a long term capital gains tax. Now, let's not, all this growing new companies, we're both for a new company tax credit. We're both for an investment tax credit. We're both for those things. He says if you hold General Motors stock for a long time, you ought to get a lower tax. Now, we had, a, we had four capital gains tax cuts, as Tom Harkin's always saying, between 1978 and 1986. Four. During that time, we lost two million manufacturing jobs. Look at General Motors. We gave them capital gains tax cuts, tax cuts, regulatory relief. The union gave them concessions. And what happened? We lost market share because the company didn't make the right decisions and because the workers weren't retrained, they didn't have the right kind of equipment and they weren't organized. To think that this across the board capital gains cut, something for nothing, in the stock is going to make a difference is wrong. Senator Sagas gave a speech in which he said, I want to be, or an interview, I want to be the best president Wall Street ever had. Wall Street tripled in the 80s. That's not where the real economy is. Look at what we did in my state. We created manufacturing jobs. I'm pro-growth, but, but to say that this middle class tax cut, number one, is the center of anybody's economic package is wrong. And number two... A lot of people have that impression, I'm sure you know. Yeah, thanks to his ad, which is false, which says that I pay for it by increasing the deficit. It, it, that's wrong. But it's also wrong to say that an across-the-board capital gains cut and relaxing the antitrust laws, which was condemned even by experts in the field, and relaxing the accountability of corporate executives to shareholders is good for the, for the economy. I think that's just dead wrong. That's exactly what we did in the 1980s, and the economy went downhill. I think it's wrong. We haven't heard. I believe the, Senator Harkin, we haven't heard from for a while. I believe the question was had to do with the cutback in military spending. Precisely. Uh, much of what Governor Brown said is correct, and others, uh, that we have to have a plan for economic conversion. By the Pentagon's own estimates, for every billion dollars that we convert from military spending to civilian spending in our military bases, it creates 6,800 more jobs. Because civilian spending has much more of a ripple effect than military spending. And so we have to have a plan. And I think what we ought to be, rather than going after each other, we, we ought to... Talk about our plans. What are we doing? Talk about our plans and talk about what Bush's plan is not. George Bush basically is letting these people, as I think Governor Clinton said, go out and drive taxi cabs. I look upon these people who worked in our defense industries as our Cold War veterans. They were the ones that really won the Cold War for us. They did everything we asked them. They worked hard. They paid their taxes. They raised their families. And they were bright. A lot of them were scientists, engineers, the best sheet metal workers in, the, in America the best machinists, and now we're saying go flip hamburgers. That's not what we ought to be about. We ought to be about job retraining and economic conversion in these plants. Jerry said it right. Building, building the next generation of commercial aircraft, the next generation of commercial shipping, high-speed rail, uh, renewable energy systems in America. I'll give you one good example of what I mean by this. George Bush wants to buy five more B-2 bombers. Absolutely no use. You know, they were supposed to evade radar, bomb a country that no longer even exists. But he says we want to buy five more at about a billion dollars a copy. And yet, right near where we sit here tonight, in Fort Worth, there's an aircraft called the V-22. I don't mean to get into specifics. The V-22, it's a tilt rotor. The whole wing tilts. It takes off vertically, flies very fast, and can land vertically. While Cheney is asking for money, uh, and Bush is asking for money for the B-2, they're cutting the money for the V-22, which we can sell commercially. In Absolutely. fact, statistics show that for this V-22, we could build 12 vertical ports in our biggest cities on the East Coast, 12 of those, 
buy 165 of these aircraft for the price of one half of a new large airport. These are aircraft we can build commercially, sell here, sell around the world. Yet Bush is cutting the funds for that, putting the money in the B-2 bomber. It makes no sense. Let me say, just in support of that, in our defense budgets at least, I don't remember the other, we both left, uh, I support the V-22. I also think we ought to have a submarine program, I, but, but... Should have a submarine program? Yeah, because we need force mobility. We need, but I, I favor far fewer forces in Europe than the president does. Would you bring them all home? No. Why would you leave some there? Uh, for two reasons. One is, uh, uh, let me say something nice about President Bush. I thought he handled himself pretty well at the NATO conference in Rome last summer, and he just put it, put it on the line of the Europeans. He said, do you want us here or not? And they said, we'd like you to stay a while longer. Uh, we may need you in Yugoslavia. We may need you in the former Soviet republics. We don't know what's going to happen. So I'd leave a force there for that. Would but you, would you, be, in, would you be in favor of sending American forces in to keep the peace in Yugoslavia? If it were part of a United Nations effort, mm -hmm. I might. Or if it were part of an agreed upon... I, 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 oh, you I know, why, was, I why do you leave all those troops oh, in Europe? They're you richer said how, than we are. How many would people. you leave? I didn't say... ridiculous. Well, wait a minute. There's a second reason. There's a second reason. <clears throat> the biggest security threat we're going to face, I think, in the near term are all these dictators, uh, some of which are in the Middle East, and of whom are in the Middle East, trying to become nuclear powers. Iraq, Iran, uh, President Bush's friends in China uh, rewarded him for Tiananmen Square <clears throat> for what he did there by opening negotiations with the Iranians on nuclear transfer. Would you be in favor of using American forces to uh, put Saddam Hussein in his place? Well, uh, let me, let's answer the European question first. I, don't uh, well, think, I mean the American forces in Europe. Yes, I don't think we need 150,000 troops there, mm -hmm. but I would leave a much smaller force there. I agree with Jerry there. A lot of them are richer than we are now in Europe. We ought to bring some, most of them home or half of them home, but we ought to leave a sizable force there for a time until we see what happens in the former Soviet republics and until we work out a long-term relationship with NATO and until we develop a UN security peacekeeping force that we know is more reliable. So I would leave some there, yes, but not yeah, 150 I, I, I just don't agree with that. I think... Would you bring them all home? I'd bring them, I'd maybe leave a thousand there and just as an exchange program and have them send a thousand over here so we can just keep a, a sense of solidarity. I think, uh, and I'm a student of, of history, a, a classics uh, scholar, <clears throat> at least I got my degree in Latin and Greek, and tell you the Roman Empire collapsed, not because it couldn't keep off the barbarians, but because internally it began to rot. Injustice, people hanging around getting uh, bread and circuses, the rich uh, living in their decadent life, and the, the poor uh, falling by the wayside. What we have here is gangs, dope, crack salesmen, murders. I mean, we got to take care of business right here. That is a much greater threat than anything over in the Middle East or in Russia. And I think the trouble with Washington is they're so preoccupied elsewhere. I want to come right back here and start putting all our attention. How do we stop this crime? How do we put these kids to work? How do we make sure they get out of school? And that's going to take more attention than the Iraq war or any of this other stuff. How many troops that, those troops in your time? First of all, I've, I've written a paper on this. In fact, a year ago, I published a book on this very subject. Uh, so if you want to get it, you can buy it at the bookstore, okay? Uh, about force reductions in Europe and how we should restructure our military forces. First of all, we have to recognize the Cold War is over. It is over, finished, done. And therefore, we have to move to new institutions. We can't keep thinking about NATO. NATO was set up for one reason, to defend Western Europe from the Warsaw Pact. Warsaw Pact's no longer there, no longer a threat. We ought to be thinking about a new kind of an institution in which we can cooperate with our European allies and friends. I have suggested phasing out NATO and building the CSC, the, the Committee on Security and Cooperation in Europe. Because that covers not just military, it covers all of the other elements on which we want to be involved in Western Europe, for example, in Eastern Europe. I think that would be a much better vehicle for us to be involved in Europe. So I've suggested that we would withdraw our troops from Europe down to a level of about 20,000. 20,000 would provide some forward basing, just in case we needed forward basing. But I think with 20,000 troops in Europe, uh, we okay. could we'd have... 20,000, your Senator Songus. Well, I think you have to keep enough troops in Europe so the commitment to NATO is unquestioned. You know, but the we don't number need NATO. Wait a minute. I didn't interrupt you. I'm sorry. Um, right. The number of troops I would say would be between 50 and 90,000. That's it. We don't need all those troops there. We don't need all the troops um, in the Middle East, in, uh, in the Pacific Rim. But the fact is, and I think Jerry pointed to that, that this country is in trouble economically that when great powers have no capacity to have their economics uh, in, in place, they will implode and they simply collapse uh, from without. 
So it seems to me that at some point, this administration has never understood that you have to go into this conversion. Uh, when I was a young intern for a congressman, this is back in the mid-60s, he was talking about conversion because he saw that eventually this problem will be upon us. And I w let me just use my time now if I could answer on some of the um, points that were made earlier. My position about American business is very clear. I said to the American entrepreneur, I'll be the best friend you've ever had because I'll help you grow, help you be profitable. That's the good news. The bad news is I'm going to hold you to a much higher standard of accountability in terms of corporate giving, in terms of involvement with education, in terms of involvement with philanthropic activities like culture, like music, like how art. You, how are you going to do that? Because you set a standard. Look at Minneapolis. In Minneapolis, they set a standard. Nothing, no law, <coughs> no promulgation. They simply say, we look for 2.5% of your pre-tax profits, and the community sets a standard. Let me make one other point, this issue of accountability. Do I want to change the laws on director liability? I sure do. I speak as a director now. Under the American law, the way it is now, a director can get sued if that director votes for something long-term, as opposed to giving money out to the shareholder. That's the reverse of what the Japanese do. What I'm trying to say is that directors have the courage to invest long-term, take a long-term perspective, mm -hmm. can have that as a defense against shareholder lawsuits. Because what's happening now in the United States is, in America, we think in three-month terms. I want to abolish quarterly reports, make it semi-annual. The United States cannot compete if it thinks in three-month terms with Japan that thinks in 10-month terms, 10-year terms. And the final point I would make... Can uh, I, Senator, could I just, uh, just on that one point, mm -hmm. am, am I being naive when I, when, when I say that I think it sounds a little bit like pie in the sky? I live what, in, you I, would, what you would do to encourage American business to change? If the American entrepreneur does not begin to think long term, there is no future. There is no future. Now, I always presume that quarterly reports were somehow given by mandate. Our competitors do not do that. We have to change the way management thinks, the way labor thinks, the way government thinks. It has to be a partnership. We are under threat. And that's what has to change. A, I, I agree with that. I, I agree we have to change our way of thinking. I don't know that going from a quarterly to an annual report makes a difference. But I think that that in it, let me ask you this, if, if, we, if we pass a law which made shareholders less able to sue directors for making long-term as opposed to short-term decisions, would you also favor giving the shareholders more say over the compensation package of the CEOs of sure. the corporation? Sure, sure. That has to happen because you know because, what's going on now? Because they don't have it today. You know what's going on now? Because when you have CEOs with very high incomes, I and mean multi-billion, Listen, I'm in that situation. I know how these things work. You destroy the culture of a company because the link between the CEO and the worker is so disparate compared to what the Japanese do that the culture of the, of the company is destroyed. You know, well, while, they're, while they're all talking about these things, that's wonderful. I've already introduced legislation to do two things. To say that any publicly held corporation that pays its CEOs more than $500,000 a year cannot deduct that from their taxes. It would not be an ordinary necessary business expense. If they want to pay him, fine, but put that on the back of the stockholders. And secondly, the second thing that my bill does, it says that stockholders have the right to vote on the compensation of CEOs and their corporate executives. That would change the way we do business in America. Uh, again, these are, uh, are nice government uh, rules that then require more lawyers to enforce. I want to see real power get to ordinary working people in the offices, uh, in the factories. That's employee stock options. Uh, Avis. 10,000 American companies are now owned in part or whole by their workers. That is going to get responsibility to keep investment here, to think long term, because those working people have the greatest stake, much more than somebody in Washington issuing uh, some kind of edict. And I want to just go from there, because we're talking about power, and I want to ask uh, uh, Bill Clinton, I mean, in your state, you don't have a Civil Rights Act. You have a right to work state. You disempower labor unions. How in the world, if blacks, and other minorities can't get the protection of state civil rights laws and uh, workers can't organize collectively and get the protections that they enjoy in 30 other states, can we really write the balance? Well, first, let me answer the question. <clears throat> let me talk, make one point about yours and then I'll answer the question. There are a lot of employee-owned companies and I support those things. I think ESOPs or employee stock ownership programs are good. But unless you also change the way they're managed and push more power down to the workers, they can't do it. Now, let's deal with the 
the two issues you raise with me. I tried to pass a state civil rights law. If you know anything about state civil rights laws, you know that the only legal significance they have are for companies that are smaller than those covered by the Federal Act. Uh, we could have passed a state civil rights law as strong as most of the other state civil rights laws in the country, which means they don't do effectively anything. And the black legislators in my state legislature said, no, we don't want another one of those meaningful, meaningless state laws. Let's quit now if we can't pass this, set up a special task force and try to pass a tough law so we'll have one of the best laws in the country. And I've appointed a task force to do that. So, I, you know, that's just, if you look at these state laws, most of them don't amount to anything. Well, no, wait a minute. Now, we wait have a, a civil thing. rights law and it's done right. tough. Now, wait a minute. And Let the black the legislators question. like it a lot. And, Bill, you've had 11 years to well, get now, through a Jerry, Civil Rights Act. And you're here trying to appeal Jerry, to African Americans let me tell you and Hispanics, and I want to see where your civil rights Jerry, program is. Chill out. Okay. You're from California. Chill out. Cool off. The <laughs> nobody, nobody <clears throat> has a better civil rights record than I do, and you know it. Even the minority legislators in my state never tried to pass a state law until they perceived fully what the gaps were going to be in this federal law in the aftermath of all the changes that have been passed. At, at, at the, by the Supreme Court. Now that, those are the facts. This was a major issue only in the last legislative session for the first time. I did my best to pass a tough law. We couldn't pass it. We're going to try to do it next time if I'm still there. On the right to work issue, as I'm sure you know, the, the federal law permits states to decide. My voters in my state have voted repeatedly to keep the right to work law. Now you may want to insult the people in my state and say they were too dumb to know what they were doing, but they voted for that. They voted for it in Iowa. That doesn't make me anti-labor that I live in a right to work state. On the subject of labor, I'd uh, like to change. Can I ask I, one more thing? Governor, excuse me. On the subject of labor, I'd like, I really would like to change. This is the important. Subject. Still, civil rights. If we're not going to come back to, I got one point. Are I you going to try to repeal 30, 14B if you're seconds. president? 30 uh, seconds. I sure am. 14B as well. Yeah. Um, the, the law, it's the law that allows states, states the right to, be to right strengthen to the rights of, of, of uh, okay. workers to really bargain. 30 correctly. seconds, Governor Brent. You are presenting yourself as the friend, uh, as strong for minority rights, and you have a lot of uh, politicians uh, supporting you on that score. But I want to ask you, you went the day before the caucuses, and you went and visited a prison. And I saw a picture in the New York Times with you and Senator Nunn with a bunch of black prisoners, almost a bunch of Willie Hortons. And I want to know what message Bill, were you trying to send to the I'll voters? I'll tell you exactly that. what message I was trying to send. I didn't. I don't any... think you were going to get any votes in a prison with a bunch of black prisoners standing around. I'll the tell you, they're not. For one thing, these are people who went into a probation program for 90 days, so they wouldn't have to go to the penitentiary. They're in a boot camp program. Most. Of, I talked to a lot of those people. Do you know how many of them graduated from high school? One. They had all violated the law. They could have all been sent to prison. They all were very glad. I asked every one of them. They were all very glad to be in this program for 90 days instead of going to the penitentiary like they would in most states, where they could be given a chance to put some discipline and order and drug treatment and education into their lives. Several of them had gotten their high school diplomas while they were in this program. These boot camps are the kinds of things we need to do instead of traditional prison. This is the kind of thing I believe in. Instead of just throwing these kids who get in trouble, who have no education and drug problems, in prison, put them in a boot camp, give them a chance to establish some discipline and order, get some drug treatment, get some education, and get their lives back in shape. I think they're a good program. I went there because that represents the kind of program I want to support. Governor it looks awfully Governor. strange with a bunch of black Go guys Governor in prison Clinton. uniforms and two white guys standing in front of them like colonial masters. I must confess, Governor Brown, I think he explained it. Uh, be that as it may, um, you've turned a subject, you've turned a corner for us. I, a number of people here in Texas said to me today, which is only, which is again very unscientific, that a president can't really do very much about crime. What do you think, Senator Songus? A president can do a great deal about everything. That's why you have a president. That's why you have leadership. I mean, let me give you one example. Are they just disenchanted with political leadership, do you think? No, there's a difference in the leadership. You know, I was a, let me give you my own personal example. I was a college student, never traveled, <coughs> came from a conservative household, I'm really not political at all. Went to college, nothing particularly spect spectacular about it. The next thing I knew, I was in Ethiopia in the Peace Corps. Why? You had a president who called you to something greater. Jack Kennedy said to my generation that there is something more. There is something more noble than self. And people responded. And that is what happened during that era. Then you bring in Reagan Bush. The me generation, get all you can, devil take the hindmost. The president sets the tone, the moral tone. You know, yesterday I spoke at the Alamo. You can't stand there and not be moved 
by all the sacrifice that people have made there in Lexington and Concord and throughout American history. And what you try to appeal to is the greatness in the American people. What Reagan and Bush did was to presume selfishness, that people want for themselves and the heck with their kids and the heck with, with everybody else. And if you don't, if you have that kind of immoral leadership, that's what happens. I think what we have to go back to is a point where an American president stands up and says, we are one nation. The symbol of my campaign is a paddle. We're all in this boat, everybody's in, nobody's out. We only go as fast as everybody can row. So people have to feel included in that. Senator Harkin, what's the, thing, what's the one thing that a president can do, guaranteed do, to curtail crime in the country? Well, I don't know if there's one, but there's at least three things. First of all, and I don't like to sound like a broken record on this, but I will, we've got to get to our kids early in life and give them the education, the health care, and the hope that they need, that they can actually do something with their lives. Uh, violent crime has increased, I think, uh, triple uh, in just the last 11 years under Reagan and Bush. A lot of it is youth crime. We're finding more and more youth committing crimes in America. I'm talking about anywhere from 17 to 21 years of age. That's the big bump in violent crimes in America. So many of these inner city kids have no hope. They haven't gotten a good education. They don't see anything but a dead-end job at minimum wage. They know they can't really raise a family or buy a home and have a part of the American dream. And so who do they see making the money? The drug pushers, the dope pushers. And so that's where they drift to and then evolves into violent crime. So you've got to get the kids early in life and give them the kind of help that they need to get them started in education. The federal government has to be more of a partner with our local schools. It is criminal what's happening in our schools today. First of all, where is it written in the Constitution that education has to be funded by property taxes? It's not there. Mm -hmm. And yet we have a system of education in America where, like, if you live in suburban Washington, D.C. and Virginia, you got great schools. Five miles away, District of Columbia, you got bad schools. I say it's a national commitment. We had to have a national commitment to elementary and secondary education, and the federal government had to provide that support. How, mu how much, how much the, debate is, the, is the, the death penalty the worth in this subject? Well, let me just finish. The third thing we need is a system, and Governor Clinton mentioned it earlier, of job training. We have to provide for every young person vocational education, job training, and retraining. And it ought to be a national system that every person in America would know that they're going to be trained for a job, and if they lose that job through technology or the industry going out of business, that they will be retrained for another job. Those are the things government can do to start stemming the tide of crime. On the other hand, we also need to get resources to our lo local police forces in America. They are sorely strapped right now. And we've got to get the resources down at the local level to first of all have neighborhood police forces where police can go out into the neighborhoods. Uh, Mayor Freeman of Tampa has done some really interesting things along this line. I'd like to take her example and broaden that nationwide. Uh, secondly, uh, cut down on drugs by interdicting the drugs coming into America. And third, by having swifter and more mm. sure prosecution in America. Where do you get the money, first of all, for the police departments? Can I stop you on that one? Well, Again, people always ask me, Harkin, Harkin, what's it going to cost? I say, that's the wrong question. The right question is, what will it cost if we don't do it? And if we don't do it, it's going to cost us a lot more. Well, some people think that's an evasive answer, too. Well, no, I would say, where do you get the money? Yeah. Well, I have called over the next 10 years under my blueprint to build a new America, and this is part of it, to cut defense spending by 50%. <coughs> that defense frees up again. $420 okay. billion dollars over the next mm -hmm. 10 years. Part of that would be used to help our local law enforcement. You know, you all talk a lot yeah. on the campaign trail about the death penalty. So would you, would you help us again just quickly on where you differ on that in terms of it being a true deterrent or not, Senator Tonga? My position on death penalty is that I'm not in favor of the death penalty for crimes against individuals. So if you kill me, I would not be in favor of you um, being executed because eventually we're going to execute someone who's innocent. Mm -hmm. okay? For crimes against society, the death penalty is society's strongest sanction. It should not be sort of given out like, you know, putting salt on, on, a, on a piece of hamburger. It should be reserved for the greatest threat to society. For me, that would include major drug dealing. We talked about crime. Major drug dealers are people who engage in commercial activities for one simple reason, to make money. So it's not a crime of passion, you and I, against each other. It is a calculated commercial endeavor. And the second category would be crimes against society, which would mean if you kill the police officer, or a judge. So you're not just killing the individual, but you're killing the representative of society. What I object to in the George Bush approach 
He wants to use this as a political weapon. So he has made the death penalty available for every conceivable crime. If you, if you park your car in the wrong place out here before the program, you may be a subject to the death penalty. Governor, Governor, it loses Governor, its value. Governor Brown, your position. I, I'm morally opposed to the death penalty. Uh, the last time a president ever used it was the Rosenbergs, and it's, it's frightening that we have a presidential campaign where people are actually thinking and talking about the president getting into the execution business. States, they have that right, they're local police, that's their business. But the real issue is this gross injustice. I stayed in a, uh, a, a homeless shelter in Baltimore last Monday night. I saw little kids with their mothers sleeping in broom closets. This is America. Right outside the street, there's empty buildings. We gotta put those things together, put these kids to work, and I have two specifics. Senator, An enterprise zone. I, I apologize, can I just stay with the death penalty for a second? Senator but I do Harkin. have specifics on how to put Senator these people to work. I'm opposed to the death penalty uh, because I have never seen any credible evidence that it's a deterrent. Secondly, it is, it is uh, uh, enacted arbitrarily. For example, uh, the killer of Martin Luther King is still alive. The killer of Robert Kennedy is still alive. Jeffrey Dahmer, who killed, what, how many, 17 people, is still alive. And yet recently, Governor Clinton's own state uh, executed a man who had killed a policeman, a heinous crime to be sure, but then turned the gun on himself and a half blew his brains out, didn't even remember the crime, he was no, no threat to anyone himself or anyone else, and yet the state of Arkansas executed this man. What kind of justice is that when the killer of Martin Luther King is still alive and Robert Kennedy's killer is still alive? That's why it's so arbitrary Governor who's put to death. Peter, you said we were all going to get to talk. I'll talk about the death penalty, but I want to talk about what the president can do about crime, too. That was the first question. Uh, I support capital punishment. We've had three executions uh, in my state since I've been governor. All three were multiple killers. Two were white, one was black. Uh, a federal judge, a Democrat, I might add, appointed by President Carter, uh, reviewed the record exclusively. My lieutenant governor, uh, extensively, my lieutenant governor reviewed the record. To, I wasn't the only person who reviewed the record and concluded that uh, under the standards of the law that the, that the conclusion Senator Harkin just drew about the man's mental state was not uh, accurate and that under the law I had no, uh, no grounds for executive clemency. So I do support the death penalty. However, I agree that uh, President Bush has used it shamelessly. I mean, in this last crime bill, trying to add 54 separate offenses, he made it a, it, I'll tell you something, my, my state, uh, has a billion chickens a year we harvest, so he wanted to make it a capital punishment to kill the federal poultry inspector uh, in the line of duty. Uh, to say that that's what the federal government's role in crime is is ridiculous. Uh, the president should, in my opinion, do the following things. Number one, not popular here in Texas for me to say, among some, we ought to pass the Brady Bill. We ought to pass the Brady waiting period. Yeah, a waiting period to check we, at whatever waiting period we need until we get all the records automated to check if somebody's got a past criminal record or a history of mental instability. Lord only knows how many people would be alive in this country today if we did it. We could have had it last year and the president played politics with the crime bill. Number two, uh, I agree with Senator Harkin. I've been to a lot of community policing experiments. The one in Tampa he referred to, the Falcon Project in Los Angeles. The, the work that's been done in the Chicago housing projects with tenants and police working together. You've got to put more police out there so they can prevent crime from happening. That's why I was one on the National Board of the National Police Corps and why I believe in the National Service Corps so much. One way you could get policemen out is to let people borrow the money to go to college and then pay it back with two years of service to their country here at home. Do what Senator Sangas did in the Peace Corps, except do it at home. Be a teacher or a police officer for a couple of years. Have the federal government pay them at a reduced rate. Uh, let me just say this. Three, 30 years ago, there were three policemen for every violent crime. Today, there are three crimes for every policeman. So the police don't have time to spend stopping crimes from happening. Federal government ought to help local government do something about that. Then I think we ought to see more things like this community-based boot camps, the one that, that Governor Brown brought up. I, I believe in those things. We have them at home. I think they'll work. I think we ought to have initiatives in school safety in violent areas. I was in that school in Brooklyn where those two kids got murdered. I gave a speech to them a month before they died. And, and they probably thought I was from another planet talking about progress, given whatever was on their minds. But I think one thing we're all agreed on, too. The crime has exploded as the family is broken down, as the neighborhoods have broken down, as the economic infrastructure is broken down. 
And these kids, the only place we're ever going to get them is in school. I think we need smaller classes in the early grades. We need elementary counselors. We need people working with them from the time of adolescence. They need to be guaranteed access when they get out of high school if they'll stay into an apprenticeship program or to borrow the money to go to college. They need to be given the opportunity to be connected to our country. There are all kinds of things we can talk about, about drug interdiction and all that, and I've got some ideas about that. But the truth is that we've got to try to rescue these kids that are becoming so violent. I mean, it is, it is shattering. Once you start spending time in these schools and talking to these children, you realize a lot of them are just smart as can be but they have absolutely no connection to the world we want them to live in. I apologize. I have to interrupt again. We'll be back uh, right after this message. We have about 15 minutes left, gentlemen. Um, you, Governor Clinton said it had gone fairly quickly. I hope the audience at home feels it that as well. Um, many of your fellow Democrats in Congress favor a free trade agreement with Mexico, and that's going to help a lot of people here in Texas. Next week, you'll also be campaigning in Illinois and Michigan, and a lot of people up there think a free trade agreement with Mexico is going to throw them out of their jobs. Senator Harkin, I'll start with you. Where do you stand on this? Well, I'm the only one sitting at this table that is opposed. Well, I guess maybe Mr. Brown was opposed to it, but I'm the only one actually that voted against it and stood up against Reagan and, well, against Bush on the fast track agreement that came through Congress last summer. Fast track giving the president the authority to negotiate with Mexico without congressional intervention at that point. That's right. And saying that when it comes to Congress, we can't amend it. We have to pass it up or down as Bush gets the agreement with Mexico. And you can also pass subsequent legislation. Yeah, but after the horse is out of the barn, okay. of course. That's why I'm opposed to it, because we didn't have any right to amend it or change it. And quite frankly, here's why I'm telling you I'm opposed to this agreement with Mexico. It's right here in this ad. You can't read it probably on television. I'll read it for you. It's an ad that appeared a year and a half ago in an industry magazine. It says, Rosa Martinez produces apparel for U.S. markets on her sewing machine in El Salvador. You can hire her for 57 cents an hour. Same ad, one year later, August 1991, last August, same Rosa Martinez, produces apparel for U.S. markets on her sewing machine in El Salvador, you can hire her for 33 cents an hour. One year, she's making 57 cents, a year later, 33 cents an hour. What happened? Fast track past the Congress. Now, what's that got to do with Mexico? Because they can ship it into Mexico and ship it right into this country. That's why I'm opposed. Now, what that ad doesn't tell you is that Rosa Martinez lives in a tin shack with a dirt floor no health care, no education for her children, and no hope. <clears throat> There's another thing this ad doesn't tell you. That when Rosa Martinez, making 33 cents an hour, sends that shirt to the United States, and you go out to buy it, you pay the same thing for it as a union laborer in America making eight bucks an hour making that shirt. So who's making the money? Sure isn't Rosa. Right. Sure not Rosa. Right. That's why I'm opposed, because it's lowering their standards and lowering our standards. I'm in favor of trade agreements with Mexico, everyone south of our border, if they first start raising their standards, their wages, Social Security, health care, have a fairer taxing system in their country, raise their environmental standards, then we can compete on the quality of a product and not on the misery and suffering of the people that make it. You'll all testify to the fact that I didn't know he had that in his pocket, right? It's okay. <laughs> we said it before. Uh, Paul, Senator, you want to go first? Senator Songus. I'm glad that you finally had a chance to use it. <laughs> It's um, true. There it is, Paul. No, it, it is true. Um, let me say that. Well, let's look at the world that's out there. Europeans getting together, 1992, European community, a powerful economic alliance. Pacific Rim, Japan, China, the other nations, they're going to start coming together. What we have to do is look at where is where our natural trading partners? They're talking about Canada, Mexico, Latin America, South America. So the idea of a North American, South American common market is our defense against what others are doing. I'm in favor of the free trade agreement. Mm. You, if yeah, I okay. could just finish. You have to negotiate on issues like worker safety and the environment. But ultimately, we are going to be alone, isolated. As the Europeans get together, they're increasingly going to do this to us. And the Japanese do the same thing. We have to look to our friends, our neighbors, to be the common market will allow all of us to prosper over time. One against, one in favor, Governor. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't like the way Bush is negotiating this thing. I don't even like calling it a free market. <clears throat> and you talked about Europe, that's a common market. The German workers are making $22 an hour. They're making a fraction of that down in Portugal and in Spain and southern Italy. They protect their wage standards. We don't have people representing working people, the folks making 
eight bucks, six bucks an hour in Mexico negotiating that deal. That's big corporate executives making two million dollars a year who are going to cut it up so they can move their plant down to Mexico. But basically you're in favor of it. I'm in favor of a totally different kind of arrangement that is negotiated by people who represent working people and not the way Bush is doing it as a way to make profit by moving to a cheap labor market. One in favor, one against, one wants a new plan, <coughs> Governor Clinton. I doubt that I would vote for an agreement that the Bush administration would negotiate, but I, I would have voted to give them the authority to negotiate. The only way we can grow richer as a country is if our trading partners grow richer. We have a good government, uh, at least a better government than we ever had in Mexico now. A person that understands market economics is trying to lift the living standards of his people. Uh, our trade deficit with Mexico has actually gone down and our volume of trade has gone up. If you go to South Texas, you will see some real benefits of increasing two-way trade. Now, I agree with Tom Harkin. I think we have to be very tough in this trade agreement not only on labor standards but on environmental standards. It shouldn't make people on our side of the border poorer. It should make people on their side of the border wealthier. But Senator Songus is also right. Unless we can expand our trading block and also generate growth in Latin America, we're in trouble. If Latin countries today had the same growth rates they'd had in the mid-70s, our trade deficit would be about 25 percent smaller. But so basic, basically you're in favor of a negotiated tough agreement. Now, but yes, but Governor Brown has a point. If you, if you go back and look at the terms on which the poor countries in Europe were taken into the European common market, you get some idea of the kinds of things we might do uh, to protect our wage base. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to point out, though, one more time, General Motors announcing all these layoffs in America is opening a plant not only in Mexico but also in Germany, which makes the point I was trying to make. We ought to in increase incentives to people who invest in this mm -hmm. country but not give mm -hmm. people incentives to hold stock in companies that will do that. Anybody, you know, who's, watched these, anybody who's watched these debates over the last, I think you're now in six plus debates, has noticed, and you mentioned it in the break a few minutes ago, there's been very little discussion about foreign policy other than the international competitive role of America. Um, do you all just feel that this is something the American people don't want to talk about at the moment, that they're so inward at the moment, Senator Sanders? Well, I think there has to be a certain threshold. You know, George Bush is going to make the argument that he has more experience than, than we do. And I served on the Foreign Relations Committee. I spent two years in Ethiopia, a year in the West Indies. But he does That's have more experience That's not as much as him. But experience and wisdom are not the same thing. Look at Tiananmen Square. He abolished the American standard on human rights by saying to the Chinese, you crushed your students. Well, that's all right. You can have most favored nation status with the United States. That experience did not help him. Look at the speech he gave in Kiev. He got up in Kiev and told the Ukrainians not to go towards, quote, suicidal nationalism and try to keep the Soviet Union together. All that experience did not prevent him from making exactly <laughs> the wrong speech at the wrong time and embarrassing this country. So he's going to come after us. Do you think the country can afford to help this, the former Soviet Union in terms of cash and still do what you've been talking about at home? Well, I said back in September we should take one, two billion dollars from our defense budget and give it to the Soviet Union to help them get through this winter so they don't stop, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, I also call for an executive peace corps. The problem in the former Soviet Union is talent, management skills, those kinds of things. You have thousands of Americans who would love to spend a year or two of their lives going over there and helping um, our new friends. And why the president does not do that? Because that's the real bottleneck in terms of their capacity to feed themselves and to grow. And I, as president, am going to establish that executive corps, this Peace Corps, and send our talented people over there to all those republics and help them get through these terrible growing pains that are inevitable. Senator Harker, why so little discussion of foreign policy? Well, I think because uh, the burdens here at home are so great. Uh, you have to see where we've been. Since World War II, our taxpayers in this country have given to fight the Cold War, defeat the Soviet Union, and defeat communism. And we've given $12 trillion, by best estimates, $12 trillion. And we won. So I disagree with Mr. Songs. He always says Japan won. I think, I believe we won the Cold War. You know, when those students marched down Tiananmen Square, they didn't march with a Toyota. They had a, they had a replica of the Statue of Liberty. That's what they wanted. So we won. Our ideals and our values won. And from here on out? From here on out, uh, we need to have a value-based mm -hmm. foreign policy based on our values as Americans. That's what we've been lacking for far too long. That's why almost 17 years ago, first bill I ever got passed in Congress was the Human Rights Amendment. 
to make as a basis for our foreign policy and our foreign aid and our military aid respect for human rights in other countries. Value-based foreign policy. Secondly, we need to take the lead in threat abatement, cutting down the arms in the world, not being the arms supplier, but joining other countries to keep arms down. That's where Bush is feeling horribly, because he is promoting more arms sales around the world rather than less. Well, Governor, I'll Clinton. Say, Governor Clinton, I'll, I'll end with you. <coughs> Go ahead. Why so little discussion well, of foreign policy? People don't want to hear it? No, I think they do, but I think they're so preoccupied at home. But let me give you the ultimate foreign policy event of the last few months. The president goes to Japan on what he calls a trade mission. It ends with the Japanese prime minister saying he feels sympathy for the United States. And then a few days later, he says we've lost the work ethic. But the truth is, people are working harder and spending less time with their kids than they were 20 years ago. It's not the work ethic. We're under-organized, under-educated, and under-led. Now, do we need to be involved in the world? You bet we do. What should we do with the former Soviet Union? Uh, help them dismantle their nuclear force, help them get through the cold months, help them convert to, uh, to a convertible currency. And I think we ought to give a lot of incentives to our companies to do joint ventures. Uh, is foreign policy important? You bet it is. But the lesson of every nation is you cannot be, be strong abroad unless you are first strong at home. And to be just a little bit cynical, uh, to talk too much about foreign policy as a Democratic candidate is to play to George Bush's strengths. No, I disagree with that. I mean, no, I, that's not I, would, I would eagerly engage him in a foreign policy debate. I have supported him on many occasions where I thought he was right, and I have opposed him on many occasions where I thought he was wrong. But he, I don't agree that he has a foreign policy for the 21st century. I think every one of us believe that he can be effectively and strongly challenged in foreign policy, and that the Democrats can be very credible. Yeah, okay. Okay. Wait a minute. I, 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 I want to First answer. of all, here, here's the guy that put Manuel Noriega on his payroll, <laughs> coddled yeah. Saddam Hussein, and supported Ferdinand Marcos. Tell me about his foreign you know, policy. One of the reasons why we don't talk a lot about foreign policy is we have so many foreigners right here, in effect. I'm not talking about people who came from another country. I'm talking about Americans who are aliens and who are exiled in their own country. I'm talking about little black kids and Hispanics, probably most of them are white, who have no future. They're living in another country, inside their own country. Now that's the reason why foreign policy seems so remote. The rot is inside here. The country is unraveling. Maybe the elites don't see it, but I'll tell you, it's there. And it's the number one challenge to the continued survival of our country. We're going to be implicated that's in the right. world, and I'd like to see our president taking the lead, particularly on the global environment and ending world hunger and stopping the arms sales. We can't uh, escape from the world. But right now, the number one threat to the continued freedom and viability of our democracy is the growing alienation and exile of tens of millions of our own American citizens. Peter, this is a person. Sorry, I make reference to mm -hmm. Bob Kerry was here, and I don't want to steal his line, but I'm going to do it. He's not here now. You can see. He, he would say he very sure. clearly. He's done it in every debate. You wish he were still here? I sure did. Because? I missed him tonight because I think we all think he made a real contribution. He, he talked about generational change. He talked about health care. Senator Sanger said it well today. He made it the number one issue in, in the, the Democratic Party in a certain way. But go ahead. I, didn't even, I just The point that Bob made was very simply was that George Bush was a product of the Cold War. And that era has ended. But his mindset is stuck uh, in that mentality. And what we represent, we have our differences. We sure do. But we represent a different generation with a different perspective that understands the threat, as Jerry just pointed out, is economic, it's social, it's cultural. George Bush has no sense of that. He's still mentally back where he was. So he's behind the American people in terms of the change that are taking place worldwide. And that's why this is a real alternative to that mindset. That's why. Yeah, 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 I want to just finish. I, I think the problem in this country is that our democracy is being killed. It's being undermined by this disproportionate power by the governing elite. And the whole, but you've asked a lot of what are differences. Uh, I, I really think in all due respect that there's a sense that you need some marginal change. Things are working okay, we just want to improve a little bit. My sense is that we need a crowbar to open up that gridlock in Washington. The extent of what is needed, I believe, is profound. And the reason why I've gone to this uh, method of not taking any more than $100, I want to disestablish 
the governing elite who I think has failed America. And I have gone to the extent even of having this 800 number because I'm trying to bring in a whole new power Give base. us the number. And I'm going to give it to you. 1-800-426-1112. I want you who are disconnected to politics to call, to join, and to take this country back. 426-1112. I'm sorry you got to do it that way, but I don't go to Wall Street does he to always, get does, does he always time it quite so brilliantly to come right at the very end? But I, I think, to be fair to all the rest of us, we believe this country needs fundamental change. And there, there are two things that George Bush can't and won't do. You know, maybe the economy picks up a little bit with low interest rates. The two things he can't do. He will not give us a national strategy to make this a high wage, high opportunity country. And he won't try to bring us together again. He won't reach out and lift up the downtrodden and bring us together. And those are the two things we all agree we got to do. Mm -hmm. well, I'd like to end, if I may, on the phrase, we all agree. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us Thank this you. evening. I'm Peter Jennings in Dallas. I want to thank particularly both our news and our technical staff at WFAA, our long-standing, uh, very true affiliate here in Dallas. We hope you've uh, found this uh, beneficial. Thank you, gentlemen. Good night. C-SPAN's Election 92 coverage resumes this evening at 8 o'clock Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time. We will take you to Miami, Florida for a forum on health care, featuring the leading Democratic presidential candidates. Florida is holding its presidential primary this coming Tuesday, Super Tuesday. Stay tuned now for more of our program schedule. C-SPAN, the cable satellite public affairs network, and its companion network, C-SPAN 2, are privately funded to serve the public by America's cable television companies. Here's a look now at the C-SPAN schedule, and please note all times mentioned are Eastern times. Stay tuned next as members of a House Judiciary Subcommittee discuss the Freedom of Choice Act. The measure would forbid states to impose restrictions on most abortions. At 6 p.m., Social Security Commissioner Gwendolyn King addresses members of the National Press Club. She assesses the state of the pension fund. After that, at 7 p.m., it's America and the Courts. Our program this week features a property rights case from South Carolina. And following the 8 p.m. Democratic Presidential Forum on Health Care, it's Journalist Roundtable. The program this week begins at 9 o'clock and features a discussion of the week's major news headlines.